sentinel. Seven days, zero hours, zero minutes, and zero seconds. 28. Durnan flashed back onto the hologram for a few seconds more. It was just enough time for him, grinning viciously, to bow farewell in the Skyther style. And then he disappeared, and all that remained on the display was a ticking timer, set for seven Earth days, counting down by the second. Blood dripped through Kay's fingers from my right hand onto the console. She let go and exclaimed, Shit! My eyes were locked to the timer. The numbers were a blocky, solid white. Six days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, 53 seconds, 52 seconds, 51 second. Oh, sex, God, I'm sorry. Kay hesitantly held her hands toward me, but didn't dare to touch me. Joelle held her breath and gazed at the timer and my bleeding hand. As if in perfect rhythm with the timer, pain gently pulsed up from my palm. I couldn't take my eyes off the countdown. Kay kept apologizing and asking me if I was okay. Joelle turned to the doorway of the cockpit and said, Where have you been? I heard Jonathan's voice from behind me respond, I... I'm sorry, I didn't know what to do. I tried to make some calls. His voice caught in his throat. I'd never heard him sound so shaky. My eyes fell to my right hand. It looked like a crimson mess, but the sight of it didn't seem to affect me at all. I felt like I was vibrating at a somehow stable wavelength. Jonathan's footsteps came closer. That looks bad, he said. It looks broken. Kay glanced toward him. I'm sorry! I was trying to help! Joelle looked at the sparking weapons console and the chunk of it which lay lifeless on the floor of the cockpit. She said, It doesn't matter. It was an accident. Jonathan, get the med kit. I heard him shuffle to the back of the room and fumble with something. The quiet hum of the ship's engine filled my senses in the space between each painful heartbeat. I looked out through the window at the black veil of space, dotted with stars, and squinted. Oh, sex, are you okay? asked Kay. I felt Joelle gently squeeze my left hand. Oh, sex she said quietly. Jonathan came over to me, stepping between Kay and I, and knelt down beside me with the medical kit in hand. He began tending to my hand, cleaning the blood from it, and prepping some medical gel. His organic eye was facing me, and I gazed into it. Oh, sex? he asked hesitantly, pausing his work. Kay and Joel were silent. I noticed through the haze that his hands were shaking, and his eye was red as though he had been crying. But I didn't remember hearing him cry. After a moment of silence, he tightened his lip and turned back to my hand, rubbing it with medical gel. Seconds passed, and I knew exactly how many, staring at Durnan's timer, each second simultaneously too fast and too slow. Kay bowed her head. Oh, sex. I'm so... Sorry. Joelle sighed. I blinked, gazing at the timer. I can't believe this happened, she continued. Your planet. Your home. Jonathan paused and looked up at me for a brief second before returning to his work. I sat motionless. Joelle shuffled in her seat. I wonder what's happening back on Earth now. Everyone knows that the Shade Beam was created by the Tau now. I wonder how people are reacting. And with this timer, they're probably terrified. Humanity has never faced something of this scale. Kay balled her fists. He's gonna pay. He's gonna pay! Joelle let go of my hand and leaned forward, gazing out into space. She grimaced. This is perfect for the Brotherhood. Astroloth is out of the picture. Faith in the Tau will be completely destabilized. The Brotherhood? asked Kay. Jonathan spoke up quietly. They're a group of revolutionaries, mostly human, seeking to destroy the power balance of the galaxy in order to rebuild a more just civilization. He gave Kay a sidelong glance. 
I'm surprised you've never heard of them. They're terrorists, said Joelle. Kay shook her head. Well, who cares about the Brotherhood? Astroloth just got destroyed. What about Osax? Joelle shifted around so she was leaning in front of me, looking into my eyes. I didn't meet her gaze. Osax, are you all right? I was silent. It's okay if you aren't. No, it's not okay, said Kay. He's gotta be fine. He is fine. She placed her hand on my shoulder. You're fine. Jonathan swiped her hand away with his arm. Careful, he commanded. Kay recoiled. I... I just want to make sure he's okay. He's clearly not okay, Jonathan spat, quivering. But... It's okay, he said, regaining his posture. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, said Kay. And why did this have to happen, huh? Why did Astroloth have to be destroyed? Why did billions of people have to die? Jonathan's eyes flickered as he worked on my hand. Maybe... You just wouldn't understand. His voice was quiet and precise. Why wouldn't I understand? Kay shouted. Joel interjected. I think he just means maybe it's not for us to understand. Maybe there is some good to come of this. I glanced down at my hand. Jonathan had cleaned up all of the blood. I tried to flex my fingers, but they barely moved, and searing pain shot up my arm. Careful not to move, said Jonathan. This kind of wound will take some time to heal, even with medical gel. You've got broken bones. I shut my eyes tightly, trying and failing to numb out the pain. It was growing stronger and more unbearable each second, and I found myself suddenly struggling to breathe slowly. With my eyes closed, images of my mother spilled into my mind. She felt so distant, but she felt alive. She couldn't have been dead. Tears started silently streaming down my face. The temple was gone. The bird on the balcony, the royal guards, the town, the mountains, the stranger at the beach, all gone. This means, said Joel, hesitantly breaking the silence, that Talcorosax is the king of Astroloth now. How can he be the king of Astroloth? demanded Kay. Astroloth is gone! Joel sighed. Well, he's the official ruler of any skythers who respect the authority of Astroloth. Kay shook her head in disbelief and looked at me. Osax, you're a king now. I couldn't bring myself to look her way, and she noticed. Come on, why aren't you looking at me? Why aren't you talking? Give it a rest, Kay. He's not well, Jonathan growled. Doesn't mean he can't talk or give us a sign, said Kay. We can't make Osex do anything, Kay, said Joelle, brushing her purple dreads to the side and sighing. I looked down at nothing in particular on the console in front of me, and she continued. We have to decide what we are going to do, though. What the hell are we going to do, asked Kay. We can't bring Astroloth back. Jonathan closed his eyes and froze for a brief moment. Joelle stood up from her chair and turned away from the window, taking another huge sigh and raising her hands to her head. We can contact the Tau fleets. See if they have any plans. You think they'll be able to come to a decision now? From what Admiral O'Kane told you, they were too worried about making the wrong move or revealing that they were responsible for the Shade Beam to actually give us a hand in hunting Durnan down before. Why would they feel different now? Astroloth is destroyed. I doubt even the Tau expected the Shade Beam to be functional so quickly. It's probably got them scared. And Durnan's threat? And the timer? They're probably planning how to stop the Shade Beam right now. They're probably scared, said Kay. But that doesn't mean they're ready to fight. You know, it's actually the fight, flight, or freeze response. There's a two out of three chance that... When did you get so interested in probability? Joelle snarked. We should return to Olympus and meet with the admirals in person. We'll need a fleet to stop Durnan and the Valakor. Jonathan cut in. You think that fighting Durnan in a head-on war will work? Even a Titan-class cruiser was little more than light rain to the mothership. 
And you can bet the Shade Beam will be outfitted with whatever armor and shielding Durnan can equip it with. Joelle put her hands on her hips. Well then, what do you suggest? Each second passed is a second wasted, and if there's a way to stop Durnan, the fleets will figure it out. My eyes glanced to the scanner still tracking Durnan's mothership. It was in a strange solar system. I furrowed my brows. I recognized the solar system, but I wasn't sure what its significance was. Jonathan replied, I'm not sure what to do, but I know the fleets will be crushed against the Shade Beam and the Valakor mothership. And that's not even factoring in any other Valakor ships he might have under his command. Wait, said Kay with a puzzled look on her face. Why would he wait seven days to destroy Earth anyway? I mean, sure, it takes some time to travel between Earth and Astroloth, even with the fastest slip space drive available, right? But way less than seven days. Joel shrugged. He's sadistic. He wants everyone to be afraid. And in pain. By drawing it out, he's only increasing everyone's suffering. And his enjoyment. She shuddered. Kay shook her head. No, that doesn't seem like enough. I mean, I agree, he's twisted beyond anything, but that can't be the only reason. Jonathan let go of my hand. That's all I can do for now, he said, but I didn't look his way. He sighed. Well, he said, turning to Kay, the shade beam is powered by a rare fuel source, the fusionite. It's possible he needs to reload it. And that takes seven days, asked Kay, unimpressed. Jonathan frowned. No, though I hear the weapon has a long recharge period, perhaps days long, maybe... How do you know that? asked Joel. I heard rumors while working on research at the base on Vorin, he replied. Why didn't you mention this earlier? Maybe you know something. I swear, I would have volunteered any rumors if I thought them believable or useful enough to mention. Who shitting cares? Kay exclaimed. Look at us. Look at Osax. What are we going to do? We're going to go to the fleet, said Joel. Don't be an idiot, said Jonathan. Then suggest something else. We could... Find the shade beam, said Jonathan with little conviction. How, said Kay. We can't, said Joel. It could already be anywhere by now. We have no idea how fast it is or where it's headed. What about the mothership? We can attack him there, said Kay. Same problem as the fleet, said Jonathan. We simply cannot expect to win in a fight against him. Then you're suggesting we just give up? Shouted Joel. No, said Jonathan hesitantly. Joel took a step toward him. Then what do we do? Unless you're about to reveal some mystical technique of yours for tracking the shade beam, this far from Astroloth and without any clear sense of its energy signatures, then I suggest you give us an alternative. Yeah, said Kay. If you're so sure that this all happened for a reason, then tell us why. Tell us what we're going to do about it. I stood up from my chair. My heart was beating calmly, and my eyes trained the floor. But I could see the three of them staring at me in silence. I looked up at my faint reflection in the window, and something glimmered in my eye. My ears were held still, and I stood up straight enough with my head angled down just a little. Osax, said Kay. I inhaled. Durnan wants the fleet to unite against him. That's why he gave a time and a place for his next appearance, Earth, in seven days. They remained silent. Which means to go to the fleet would be a waste of time, I continued. I lifted my right arm to my chest and rubbed my wrist with my left hand. Astroloth is gone, I said, gazing at my hand. I looked up at the stars. We aren't. I could feel a glow of energy inside me coming into focus. I could feel it building in the room between us. He was sending that message from his mothership, far away from Astroloth, and to his knowledge, completely hidden. He must expect the Tau and Skyther colonies to send ships to Astroloth looking to confront the Shade Beam. I took a deep breath. 
Meanwhile, he's hiding away on his mothership. What do you mean? asked Joel. I stepped away from them back toward my chair and continued. He's scared. That's what I mean. He's scared. Somehow. Despite all the grandeur, he knows he has a weakness, and he's betting that no one will figure it out. He's distracting everyone with a shade beam and assuming that no one will be able to find him out there on the mothership. Jonathan slowly chimed in. I don't understand. He thinks no one can track him. He never knew that we got so close to him in the nebula. Jonathan persisted. But even so, why would he hide? The mothership is, for all intents and purposes, invulnerable. Fire was kindling inside me. I whipped out my left hand to the glass of root beer I'd left on the counter and snatched it up, whirling to face Jonathan and the others as my ears lifted and my eyes narrowed in a confident smile. Exactly. He would only hide if he had a reason to. A weakness. Joel's eyes glimmered, and Jonathan looked at me with hesitant appreciation. Kay's mouth was open, slowly morphing into a smile. He's confident in every way except about this one weakness, I said, gesturing to the scanner. He's... And what is that weakness? interjected Jonathan. I don't know, I said. I don't know what the weakness is, but we may be the only ones who can find out. How do we do that? asked Joel. I narrowed my eyes and took a long drink of fizzy root beer. We follow him. We find the mothership. We find out what he's doing on Malum, and we find out how we can use that knowledge to stop him for good. Malum? asked Kay. That system he's in, I said, pointing to the scanner. The only notable planet there is Malum, and he's a Loro. And remember the picture I salvaged from the Loro computer on Vorin? It was taken on Malum, said Kay, grinning. Joel and Jonathan glanced between each other. Precisely, I said. He must have a reason to be there. And it must have to do with the Loro. There was a moment of silence. Joel glanced at the timer. Well, she said, reaching for the controls of the ship. We have six days. Twenty-three hours and fifty minutes, give or take. Let's stop wasting time. The stars peeled back around the firebrand as once more we kicked off into slip space. Jonathan stood up, moving past me to head to the kitchen with a sigh. You know, this is a huge gamble. You're a scientist, I said. Sometimes, you just have to test your hypothesis. He smirked at me, and his gaze pierced mine for a second. His long coat trailed behind him as he exited. I took a deep breath drink in hand, and looked out the window. Kay stood up, smiling. Her eyes darted down to my bandaged, broken hand, and her smile disappeared. Tears started forming in her eyes, and she brushed them aside before they could. Oh, Sex, you know I'm so sorry. I... I was only trying to comfort you. I felt strangely balanced. An incredible weight lay in my heart, and I knew everything had changed in the galaxy. But something had also changed in me, and in that moment I felt an equally powerful force raising me up to meet the collapse of things. I knelt down and opened my arms for a hug, and Kay hesitantly opened her arms and wrapped them around me as gently as she could. With my face next to hers, I closed my eyes and whispered to her, Never apologize.